Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day um, in which we have the wonderful opportunity to listen to one of our junior faculty members, um, Doug Martini from the Department of Kinesiology, who will be talking to us. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Doug present today as part of the Dean's Seminar. Um, for those of you who don't know, he got his PhD at the University of Michigan and completed a postdoctoral research at the Oregon Health and Science um, University. Um, he's had very extensive training and very interesting sort of background in which he really tries to understand the effects of the central neural dysfunction on motor and cognitive performance due to either neurotrauma and neurodegenerative diseases. And as we were talking about before, you know, aging is one of those diseases. So for those of us who are interested in healthy aging, his work has huge implications for, um, for what we can potentially do to help us age well and maintain our neurocognitive um, functioning. On a lighter side, you know, um, we always ask for our faculty members to give us a little bit of tidbit about themselves. And Doug was willing to share the fact that he loves spending time with his wife, which we're so thankful for, and his dog, especially outdoors and um, on the coast. And so I'm hoping that he has been able to um, gotten familiar with the New England coastline, which is quite beautiful. And um, very similar, I think, to some of us, we had this conversation at lunch that nothing beats a well-brewed cup of coffee. And we were talking about how nothing beats a well, you know, um, cup of tea in the morning. So we all need our caffeine. And so we share that with you, Doug, um, for sure. So thank you very much for um, presenting today. And I know we're going to learn a lot. All right. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Dean. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research, which revolves around the mobility impairments observed in both neurodegenerative populations as well as the neurotrauma populations. Uh, but before I get into the nitty gritty details or the very interesting results that I have, I'm gonna go and define what I mean by mobility. So that is, by mobility, I mean gait and standing balance. Uh, so over 17 million US adults complain of gait difficulties. And within this window, over 60% of our 80 year old uh, or people in uh, the US who are 80, 80 years and older uh, also complain of gait difficulties and have been diagnosed with a gait disorder. Uh, mobility deficits often lead to falls, which is unfortunate, and they lead to roughly 3 million ER visits per year uh, for a fall related injury here in the US, and then roughly 800,000 hospitalizations related to those 3 million ER visits uh, for the fall-related injuries, typically uh, the head, which is unfortunate, uh, or the hip as well. And aside from these very obvious to the naked eye gait deficits of visually seeing somebody falling, there are also subtle impairments that can lead to misdiagnoses, which often lead to then a decrease in quality of life that goes undetected or at least undiagnosed in a lot of people with subtle gait deficits. And what do I mean by subtle gait deficits? Well, explicitly, I'm talking about deficits that you can't see from the naked eye. So here on the left, I have a video of uh, an individual diagnosed with Parkinson's disease roughly five years in and a, a, a moderate uh, diagnosis score for the disease. And you can see in this turn here, there's on block turning, which means that the individual turns as one full unit and doesn't have a head trunk uh, and then lower half transition through the turn. It takes much shorter steps, much shorter strides than this individual on the right who uh, was diagnosed with a concussion um, and is still complaining about prolonged symptoms associated with the injury. But to the naked eye, there's not a whole lot going on as far as gait deficits or gait impairment in this individual. And in order to benefit or increase the rehabilitation efficacy for both of these populations, it's very, very important to be able to identify gait deficits, whether they be obvious or subtle in both of these populations. So how can we do that? 
generally speaking, in the clinic, questionnaires and clinical assessments are the go-to way to assess gait. Uh, this typically relies on, as I uh, mentioned, um, visual observation, which has its inherent limitations. Uh, it relies on questionnaires, so asking people with gait difficulties how gait affects their uh, daily activities and if they feel like they're unsteady. Um, these are typically not the best ways to quantify gait in groups that have subtle gait deficits. Uh, if we move to the lab, we're able to implement cameras, gait mats, treadmills, force plates, and inertial measurement units, or IMUs, that use uh, much more acute technology to quantify or characterize very specific components or characteristics of gait, those being um, how fast somebody's walking, the stride length, the path of the center of mass of an individual through space as they're walking. And then aside from the lab, the last real space, I guess the final frontier for gait assessment is gait assessment in the real world. Um, this can be done with IMUs or can be done with activity trackers, although the difference between uh, real world activity tracker mobility assessment and IMUs is that typically activity trackers give you the quantity of mobility. So how often somebody's walking, how often somebody's sedentary, um, how often somebody is uh, out and about and perhaps at what vigorous activity levels where IMUs can again, give you very detailed characteristics of the quality of gait. So are, is the individual turning um, at, at an average turn velocity for their population? Uh, are they taking shorter strides than somebody within their average population? Um, most recently, I've switched to implementing IMUs, given the flexibility of being able to use them in the lab, in the clinic, and as well as in the real world environment. <clears throat> you really only need six IMUs, where you can see in this picture here, on uh, the mother of one of my previous faculty advisors. Um, she is modeling the setup where you have two IMUs on the wrist, two on the feet, one around the waist, and one on the sternum of an uh, individual. In this setup, you're able to quantify gait and receive roughly 50 characteristics standard output from the uh, accompanying software, but you're also able to then use the raw data and calculate uh, however many other variables of gait you would like to assess at this point. So while IMUs are great, uh, and while being able to quantify gait at this very acute level is ideal, it does open the door to another problem of having simply too many characteristics of gait to assess or analyze uh, at a time. So the, the way that we wanted to approach or the way that we want to approach gait assessment is to quantify gait looking at as many possible components of gait while avoiding as much redundancy uh, of those characteristics for quantifying gait. And one way that we do that is by implementing gait domains. This is something that we kind of stole from the cognitive literature uh, and that the cognitive literature has been using cognitive domains to provide better overall uh, scores for individuals within the different domains of cognition. Here I provide two examples, one specific to a Parkinson's population and another specific to a concussion population. And what you can see here, uh, I'll just focus on the Parkinson's group for now, are individual gait characteristics, uh, so let me just get the laser pen going, uh, of gait speed, stride length, foot strike angle, turn duration, turn velocity, and the number of steps in a turn. These independent gait characteristics alone have been condensed into one factor of gait, that being called pace and turning, given the variables that make up that factor, uh, which makes up 38% of the total gait model, 38% of the variation of the total gain model. Um, within Parkinson's, there were four predominant uh, factors or domains for gait. It was pace and turn, as I just described, then rhythm, variability of gait, which looks at just really the standard deviation of the averages for some of the previously discussed gait characteristics. And finally, trunk movement. When my colleague, 
tried to mirror this um, gate domain assessment in a concussion population. Uh, he found some similar gate domains, but also found that the weights of these gate domains varied um, from those that were identified in the Parkinson's disease population. Specifically here, we're saying that variability had a higher weight and higher impact when describing concussed gait. Uh, rhythm was about the same. Pace and turning actually separated out within this population, but carrying roughly about the same weight or equivalent weight to each other for the concussion gait model. Now, I must say there's a big caveat to these two gait models in that they were used or they were created using uh, PCA analysis or principal component analysis. So while the sample for the Parkinson's disease group was over 300 and the sample for the concussed group was over 150, still not very acceptable to take these gate models outside of these two very distinct samples of ind individuals with Parkinson's and concussion and apply it to a new population. Um, so I have used these two models specifically, and you'll see these two models throughout some of the results section that I have, but I will not uh, apply this to any new data that I have from a separate population because PCA analysis is less robust across populations as it is within a population. Um, this is a very important technique, not only to reduce the um, number of total variables that you look at with gate, but ideally it helps deal with some of the heterogeneity within gate variables within a Parkinson's or concussion population, even within an older adult population. <clears throat> So aside from looking at just the quality of the way somebody walks in a straight gait, it's very important to think about the complexity of gait in the real world environment. So here I'm trying to emphasize the point that gait in a laboratory is very different than gait out in the real world. And here I have two examples of just crosswalks in two different locations in which you have a mass amount of environmental stimuli that any one individual needs to pay attention to in order to successfully navigate the intersection. And that would be without falling or bumping into somebody else. It, one way that we can do this in a laboratory setting without getting hundreds of people in the lab at a single moment in time would be to implement what's called dual task gate. What dual task gate does is it tries to overburden any sort of higher order compensatory mechanism one might employ to try and correct for any um, brainstem or lower order gate control system that is impaired within these neurological populations. An example of this would be uh, something that I have here on the bottom left or an individual wearing IMUs on the sternum and the lumbar region of vertebrae, as well as each wrist and each foot listens to a series of letters being read off through headphones and they are tasked with responding by pushing a button in their dominant hand every time they hear the sequence AI and only when they hear the sequence AI, which is meant to distract the attentional processes of the frontal lobe away from walking and on to this secondary task. Um, another task that has been used is a play on the Stroop test where you need to say the color that the word of a color is written in. So in this example, you would say green and not red. Um, but instead of using colors, there would be a high and a low pitched voice saying the word high and low in their respective voices. And the participant is supposed to respond to the pitch of the voice and not the word that they heard from that pitched voice. Again, same idea here is just to detract some of those attentional resources dedicated to compensating for any sort of gate dysfunction to a secondary task to try and tease out these subtle differences that may exist underneath the surface to mimic the real world environment. So what we found using these um, gate domains uh, within people with Parkinson's disease is that 
In general, people with Parkinson's walk slower and turn slower than older adults. So here I have two plots. I have a pace and turning factor or domain for a single task walking. This is a two minute walk just back and forth requiring 180 degree turns at each end. Uh, each dot represents a participant. The dashed line represents the group mean. And then it's just a box and whisker plot. Aside from that, the green dots are for the older adults. And then over here on the far right, I have pace and turning during dual task. Uh, again, same format, dots are participants. PD in blue, older adults in green. And the lower the dot is on each of these plots, the slower the individual is walking or turning. And this is a group of 81 people with PD, about 67 years old, um, eight years within the disease duration on average being tested on levodopa. So this would be their best walking performance given that they're on the medication used to treat the motor signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease with roughly a mild um, diagnosis for the motor component of the disease. So the MDS UPD or S3 is the Movement Disorders Scale or the Movement Disorders Society Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And part three is very specific to how the disease affects the, their motor ability. Our older adult group um, was not as, not quite as large, slightly older, but not significantly older, uh, with very luckily a very low uh, UPDRS3 score, indicating very little Parkinson's related motor anomalies. Um, I just wanted to point out before I hop into a different topic real quick. Uh, so this plot down in the left-hand corner, again, same format, however, looking at just stride length, and you can see that there's a lot more heterogeneity in the performance of the Parkinson's group compared to the older adult group, looking at a single gate variable opposed to taking the Z scores of each of those uh, gate variables that make up the pace and turning domain and comparing them group to group. That said, there's still quite a bit of heterogeneity within the Parkinson's group performance. Unlike the people with Parkinson's disease, uh, concussion effect can affect multiple domains of gait, but that was specific to a dual task gait situation. So here's an example in which implementing dual tasking, increasing the complexity, of the walking task was required to elucidate these underlying or subtle gait deficits within this population. Um, so this time the control group is in blue and the concussed or MTBI, which is just an acronym for mild traumatic brain injury, um, is in green. And MTBI and concussion are the same. They, they are synonymous to each other. Here we're looking at the turning domain within the concussed group. Remember, turning and pace were separated out within the concussion group. Uh, and then the pace domain during dual tasking. In both cases, the concussed group was walking significantly slower but, and turning significantly slower than the control group. And this is from a representative group of 65 people with a concussion, still complaining about symptoms roughly three months after the injury and on average about 40 years old. While a control group, again, slightly smaller, um, but not significantly smaller and uh, 37 years old on average, and very importantly, asymptomatic because they haven't had a concussion. Aside from being able to quantify gait, we can also quantify measures of standing balance with these wearable sensors or IMUs. Um, luckily, there are fewer variables to deal with, but still if you start adding different balance tasks, uh, now you're multiplying each of those variables by however many conditions you're looking at, or however many tasks you're requiring. Um, so there are groups that have calculated domain scores for balance, um, which I haven't done for the results you're about to see, but my colleague has done for results in the Parkinson's populations that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, instead of using six sensors to quantify standing balance as we did for gait, you only need one sensor and you're gonna put it around the waist, again, over the lumbar region, uh, backside, of the individual. So one of the common balance assessments is the clinical test of sensory interaction on balance or 
SITSIB for short. And this is a four condition balance assessment. Two conditions are on firm surface, two conditions are on foam or compliant surface, uh, and then two, one condition each of the firm and the foam are with the eyes open, and, and one condition each of the firm and the foam is with eyes closed. Participants are asked to stand with their hands on their hips, feet about hip width apart for at least 30 seconds. And by 30, at least, I mean for 30 seconds, and that's the cutoff score. So the outcome variable for this clinical assessment is how long up to 30 seconds can you hold your position uh, in any one of these conditions? Um, whereas if we used the, get rid of this, laser pointer real quick. If we use an IMU tracking over the waist, you can see that there's a bit more detail to tracking somebody's center of mass motion through space across the 30 second time window. Um, so this plot is supposed to serve a twofold purpose. One, that obviously we can get more detail from an individual standing on any one of these uh, stance conditions. And two, trying to highlight the fact that even though I'm saying standing balance, which seems like a static task, um, standing balance isn't truly static in that we're all constantly moving, uh, albeit very subtle movements. Um, so I think the appropriate term here we'll use moving forward is gonna be quasi-static in that it's mostly static in that your limbs aren't really moving, ideally, unless you're catching yourself or falling, but you're still moving in general. <clears throat> all right. So here is an example of the results from looking at people with Parkinson's disease and older adults. These are gonna be the same groups that I mentioned uh, previously, so same demographics um, are, exist for this group of plots as well. So this result sway area just is a description of how large of, of an area this individual swayed using that one sensor. Uh, over their lumbar region during single and dual task. And again, regardless of if it was single or dual task, so pretty straightforward or complex, uh, there was a significant, there were significantly more sway in the Parkinson's group than there was in the older adult group. Um, and this was only for standing on firm ground with eyes open. So we haven't even gotten into the complex parts of that gait assessment, those with eyes closed and those with uh, the foam instead of the firm ground. And that enough, or that is e enough in order to be able to differentiate these two groups. However, when we look at the concussed group, that wasn't the case. Um, so same demographics apply for this as I had applied for the Parkinson's group. Um, on the left side here, we have the SITSIB total time, so this is the clinical score, this would be what is the total amount of time across those four conditions added up. So the best possible score you can have is 120 seconds because you had four conditions at 30 seconds a piece. And then on the right side, we have the root mean squared of the sway area in the medial lateral plane, so that's side to side, um, using one of these sensors over the waist, and what really stands out here is that the clinical score could have correctly identified about 15 of the 67 people uh, with a concussion that, that they had poor balance uh, with an area under the curve of 0.63. Where if we looked at the IMU outcome, there's 36 of the 67 people with a concussion had much worse uh, sway than the control group, just looking at the upper whisker within the box and whisker plot uh, of the control group. And this led to an, uh, an area under the curve of 0.81. So a significantly better uh, way at characterizing sway deficits. And this p-value is not a correct p-value. That's a bad copy and paste that I will fix for sure. Because uh, that was not significantly different, just to be perfectly clear. Um, <clears throat> so part of the group that I worked with uh, was within the Pacific Udall Center out at Oregon Health and Science University, or HSU. And within that group, there was a subset that were, were the cognition experts. 
And I thought it was my duty to see if I can use uh, any sort of cognitive assessment to help explain some of that variability or heterogeneity uh, within each of the older adult and Parkinson's populations uh, to see if we can try and better target uh, an area of issue uh, within each one of those populations to improve both cognition and mobility over the, the course of the disease. Um, so just in general, some points of interest. At the time of PD diagnosis, roughly 20% of the people will have mild cognitive impairment, which is a cognitive issue that exists, but is not bad enough to cause changes or affect activities of daily living. Um, but then across the duration of the disease, up to 80% of people with Parkinson's will be diagnosed with dementia, which is about four to six times greater than an otherwise healthy elderly population. So very clearly an important component to look at, given that we already know that cognition plays a role on gait outside of Parkinson's disease. So as I alluded to earlier, there are multiple domains of cognition, and this idea was borrowed to create those domains of gait. The most common domains of cognition include executive function, attention, memory, uh, language, and visual spatial skills. Um, and Brenna Collerton, who was the cognitive expert in the Pacific Youth Center, set out to get the best tests for um, building each one of these domains out. And this citation, which you see at the end, highlights which of those tests are the relevant tests for cognition, at least in the Parkinson's population. So my colleague, Rosie Morris, took the first stab at this, and in a larger cohort, cohort of people with PD, uh, 198 to be precise, she looked at the relationships between those gate domains that she identified and the cognitive domains that were identified by Brenna Collard. Um, and here are two plots. On the left is the gate domains in blue. On the right are standing balance domains in green. I mentioned previously that there was an attempt to make domains for uh, balance. Um, I just wasn't particularly interested in them, so I didn't really carry that through. That's more of a selfish issue than anything else. Um, but what Rosie found, the important fact here, is that the frontal cortex, which is involved in executive function and attention, uh, consistently significantly related to gait domains, specifically pace and turning. Uh, at correlational values, partial correlational values of 0.35 and higher for most of the pace and turning gate variables. And this was a specific example for phonemic fluency, which is the ability to say as many words as possible that begin with a specific letter within a one minute window. So if your letter is T, you have to say as many words that begin with the letter T uh, within one minute that don't include proper nouns. So Tom and Tallahassee wouldn't count for those words. However, in the visual spatial um, domain, that related the most to standing balance, specifically the domain of area and jerk, which I already kind of mentioned area uh, earlier and just looking at how large of a sway uh, area somebody uh, has within Parkinson's disease or older adult population. Um, so this is just kind of highlighting that two separate domains of cognition relate to different components of mobility, that being either gait or uh, standing balance, which kind of highlights there's likely different pathways responsible cortically and subcortically um, related to both cognition and motor performance involved in um, motor dysfunction in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, <clears throat> I had a small attempt I think if I could identify something similar in people with concussion, though it's important to note that sustaining a concussion doesn't mean mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, there's very transient cognitive issues within Parkinson's disease. It's more or less uh, persistent headache or persistent dizziness that is a complaint. Um, but I did find the cognitive component of the Neural Behavioral Symptom Inventory, or NSI, which is just a, as it says, symptom inventory, 
people rate 22 symptoms on a scale of one to six, uh, all of these symptoms being highly correlated to concussion. So adding up this domain score uh, and plotting that on my x-axis, higher being worse, and then taking the PACE dual task domain, which was significantly different between those with and without a concussion, and then looking exclusively within the concussion group, observed a, an interesting correlation such that people who reported higher or worse scores in the cognitive domain of the uh, NSI walked or tended to walk slower than those who reported lower scores, suggesting that there may be an actual interplay uh, between self-perceived cognitive deficits and um, objective performance uh, in a, a gate test that requires a complex component to be completed while walking. So because I was not able to completely explain all the heterogeneity observed in gait with cognition, I thought the next step is clearly to look at the role of neuroimaging in mobility to see if I can identify cortical regions um, that could help explain some of the heterogeneity that I observed uh, in the in gait and standing balance in Parkinson's disease patients and older adults. <clears throat> My first attempt used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is more of a static motor technique. Uh, it requires you to place a figure of eight coil, which induces a magnetic field, and then that changes the electrical excitability of the cortex, which induces a finger twitch of the first dorsal interosseous muscle um, when placed over the motor region associated with the first dorsal interosseous muscle. The technique that I specifically use, though, is called short latency afferent inhibition, or SAI. And this is a technique that is supposed to get at um, the quality or the integrity of the sensory motor inhibition system. So in order to measure SAI, or the sensory mo motor inhibition system, you have to peripherally, so over the median nerve, electrically stimulate the median nerve roughly 20 seconds prior to inducing a excitability change of the cortex. Uh, and that allows for the peripheral signal to reach the cortex, so ascend from the wrist to the cortex and try and provide an inhibitory response to that descending signal uh, induced by the TMS technique. So what does this look like uh, for the outcome variable? <clears throat> so here on the left side, I have, or on the y-axis, the MEP plot, so the motor evoked potential, uh, and on the x-axis, it's time. In this gray box, I have labeled the artifact associated with the transcranial magnetic stimulation pulse, or the TMS pulse. This isn't anything reflective of a response by the participant, just a, an electrical signal associated with the TMS application, and it's this yellow highlighted area, which is the resultant MEP from that TMS pulse. And so the larger the MEP response, the larger the finger twitch associated with that, that, MEP, or that TMS stimulation. Now I have three colors on here because I have three examples of um, no limited and fairly standard inhibition response to that peripheral simulation. So this gray line within this resultant MEP box is the natural response to just cortical stimulation. So that means no peripheral stimulation, just a TMS stimulation of the motor cortex. In these uh, green boxes, I have the artifact associated with that peripheral electrical stimulation of the wrist. Uh, orange is from the limited uh, inhibitory response and blue to that very nice, very clear and obvious inhibited response. So this ascending peripheral signal provided a very nice inhibition of the motor cortex. The pathway of which is very hotly debated right now. Um, I haven't picked a side yet, 
That's mostly because I don't think either side provides a very compelling argument. Uh, and I choose to sit it out until I see a, uh, a compelling argument be made. So just know that the smaller the MEP response, the more inhibition uh, is observed from that peripheral simulation, suggesting a good integrity of the sensory motor inhibition system. So luckily, I was able to replicate the literature and show that people with Parkinson's disease have worse sensory motor inhibition than otherwise healthy older adults. However, as I'm sure you can see and remember how many times I've pointed out so far, quite a bit of heterogeneity going on within each of these groups for this individual measure. Um, and just to be clear, the higher the value, the worse the inhibition. So I wasn't really holding my breath that this technique of um, assessing cortical activity was gonna be the solution for describing the heterogeneity observed within the gait and balance uh, of older adults and people with Parkinson's disease. However, I did establish through partial correlations. Here, my partial correlation uh, is due to the fact that I'm controlling for age, um, gender, education, history, and hmm, there are one more. Within people with Parkinson's, it's them being uh, the, the levodopa daily equivalency score, which accounts for how much dopamine the individual takes and tries to create a comparative value like, to the rest of the people who also take dopamine. That will become important in a couple of slides. But what's important from this slide is just to highlight that looking at uh, gait variability, whether that be stride length variability or the variability of the foot strike angle, uh, was associated, more variability was associated with worse inhibition in people with Parkinson's disease. And then were more jerkiness of sway, or less jerkiness of sway was associated, no, I lied, sorry. More jerkiness of sway was associated with less inhibition within this Parkinson's population as well. Within older adults, it was jerkiness of sway and sway area with worse and worse being associated, and then gait speed. Uh, so the slower somebody walked, the worse their inhibition was as well. So this kind of indicates that the sensory motor pathway is an important pathway for mobility performance, but it certainly isn't explaining or helping explain the heterogeneity observed previously. Now, the reason why I had to control for levodopa in the partial correlations for the people with Parkinson's disease is because if somebody in, with Parkinson's disease is off medication, here represented in this light green or sea foam green, they have relatively normal SAI compared to older adults. But when they go on their levodopa medication, that significantly decreases their sensory motor inhibition, making it a significantly worse inhibition than older adults, whether the older adults are also off or on levodopa medication. And within the older adult group, regardless if they were off or on medication, there was no real change to sensory motor inhibition, which opened up a, another big question as to why people with Parkinson's disease see this shift, this decrease in inhibition going off to on, getting worse, and why there was no change in older adults, um, which unfortunately I didn't have the ability to look into for that study, um, but certainly something that I'm very interested in trying to figure out moving forward. So the conclusions I have from this work, this recent work to date, is that uh, heterogeneity for mobility exists across all neurological pathologies, not just the, the few that I looked at here. Um, and that while some factors might help explain heterogeneity, specifically cognition, maybe to a degree sensory motor uh, pathway integrity, uh, there are many that obviously have not been identified. So I think one of the key limitations to the work that I've done to date has been looking at static position uh, cortical activity, which would be similar to looking at somebody in an MRI scanner and scanning the brain and then having them come out of the scanner and walk around and compare those two um, or trying to relate the brain health 
of the that individual to the gate performance of that individual, <coughs> or have somebody seated and stimulate their brain and see how the brain responds, and then set. Uh, similarly, compare that to a task they perform either earlier or later, in which I'm not stimulating the brain. So my goal in the future is to look at or quantify cortical activity during these mobility tests. And that brings me to those future directions uh, and what I'm setting up to do here at UMass. So the technique that I've selected to be able to quantify cortical activity or brain health during um, these mobility tasks is uh, mobile functional near infrared spectroscopy or FNIRS for short. <clears throat> this is a picture of what a headband FNIRS system looks like. This uh, sensor in the center receives near infrared light from each of these sensors surrounding it. Um, and then using uh, those sensors and caching the data in an onboard system, you can look at changes in concentration for oxygenated, which is here in red, and deoxygenated here in blue, hemoglobin. So on these two plots, I have a uh, time on the x-axis, and then I have the change in concentration in micromolar per liter on the y-axis. And then I have a two minute walk here and a two minute walk here. The key difference is that this two minute walk was completed by um, an otherwise healthy 25 year old. And this walk over here was completed by a 25 year old who was complaining of persistent symptoms of concussion. And what's unique about these two is that um, this plot here, which shows an initial increase in oxygenated hemoglobin and then a decrease across a single task walk um, mirrors what's been provided in the literature suggesting that the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that the system was over, um, activated at gate initiation and then deactivated, not fully, but um, was not involved in the um, gate cycle or the gate performance from then on. <clears throat> However, in the person who complained of persistent symptoms of concussion, you see that initial increase in prefrontal cortex activity, and then it continued to increase or maintain a high level uh, compared to that otherwise healthy individual, suggesting that there might be some sort of underlying compensatory mechanism, even in people with uh, a concussion and persisting symptoms. Um, something that I, I hope to continue to move down, um, but that's just kind of highlighting what FNIRS and the value that it can provide, the, the measure it can provide for you. So while the prefrontal cortex is interesting, um, I'd like to move and consider more parts of the brain during these motor attacks because uh, as you saw in that otherwise healthy individual, the prefrontal cortex isn't the end all when it comes to motor performance. Um, so other areas that I have interest in include the posterior parietal cortex, or the PPC, uh, and this is a major center for visual spatial processing uh, located just back here in the parietal lobe, uh, receiving lots of information from um, areas brainstem and below, as well as from the primary sensory cortex, as well as the vestibular cortex, and then relaying processing and relaying on that information up to the frontal lobe. Specifically here, we're talking about the premotor areas. <clears throat> so kind of as I was highlighting it, the PPC uh, engages and registers the spatial temporal relationships between our body and our environment. So it's kind of a, a combination of proprioceptive and visual information uh, being processed and relayed to help select the appropriate motor program for whatever task is at hand. And this is the completed through the premotor areas and the motor cortex. So one project that is getting very, very close to being off the ground is a collaboration with a colleague of mine here in the kinesiology department, uh, Dr. Walter Hoog-Kammer. And we're looking to see if we can identify potential cortical mechanisms 
responsible for gait impairment in older adult fathers. And we have two aims at this point. Uh, the first seeing what the effects of age and fall status are on both the posterior parietal cortex and the prefrontal frontal cortex uh, is during gait. And then we're gonna see if we can find some sort of mediation of gait performance on fall predictors uh, by cortical activity, whether it be an individual cortex's response to the gait performance or a change in a difference in the connectivity or the relationship of the activity between those two cortices. Uh, we'll be recruiting young adults, so those college students, so abundant, uh, older adults without a fall history, and then older adults with a fall history is the goal <clears throat> and the gate task that we're interested in using uh, is a stepping stone paradigm that Wouter is familiar with in which we will project lighted stepping stones onto a split butt treadmill and we will use the person's own preferred gait for speed, so their stepping pattern to um, project these stones to those preferred speeds. And then once we have those two aligned in which their steps are hitting the lights as they should, uh, we will move one of those lights, either lateral or medial, so towards the midline, away from the midline, uh, make it a long step or make it a short step and see how they respond both behaviorally. So can they make the accurate step adjustment uh, as well as neurophysiologically to see are they incapable of making that step adjustment because there's some cortical level disconnect that is not allowing that correction to be made behaviorally. Um, in general, we expect that the older adult fallers uh, will have more PPC and PFC activity, uh, as well as less step accuracy than the older adult non-fallers, especially the young adults. Um, and then there are some other uh, expectations based on gait performance specifically, so reduced dynamic stability, which gets at how uh, well controlled an individual uh, keeps their center of mass within their base of support. Um, and then we'll see if gait performance is a significant predictor to the cortical activity, which is again, trying to mediate that relationship between gait performance uh, and fall predictor status. And ultimately we'd like to take this out of the older adult population and into the neurologic population. But as the Dean said at the outset, it's not as if older adults or aging isn't itself um, kind of a neurological population to begin with, given the natural uh, neurodegeneration that occurs with age. Another project that I'm very interested in getting off the ground relatively soon here is going to be looking at a, assessing motor automaticity in the concussed. Uh, and by motor autom automaticity, I mean the ability to complete a motor task um, without any sort of higher order cortical control involved. So this would be kind of similar to comparing single task gate to dual task gate or from going from an unlearned motor task to a, a learned motor task. Once the task is learned, that's the final stage in motor learning and that's considered an automatic task at that point. Um, so we have three aims at the outset uh, that we're interested in addressing. First, to determine the effects of concussion on cortical activity during gait, uh, as that fully hasn't been realized yet. Um, and then we want to look at quantifying motor learning during a novel stepping task, and not the one that I just talked about. I'll show you the, the other one uh, in a group of people with a concussion. And then see if we can also identify changes in cortical activity throughout or across the motor learning process to see if we get a shift from what would be a predicted prefrontal cortex M1 heavy connectivity to a um, premotor area M1 heavy connectivity. Because as a task becomes learned, there's this natural shift in connectivity within the cortex that moves it from this less automatic to more automatic uh, task. This will be completed maybe in three groups, uh, definitely a concussed group that is symptomatic, uh, an asymptomatic concussed group, and then possibly a control group depending on um, the size and feasibility of this. And so our approach is gonna be quantifying uh, frontal activity, that being the prefrontal cortex, the supplemental 
and pre-motor areas, as well as M1 during single and dual pass gait, as well as quantifying skill acquisition on this novel stepping task in which individuals are presented with a screen and a direction to step, and they have to map that. So it's very similar to um, the task that some of you may know, uh, Dance Dance Revolution, um, but just not as, uh, maybe not as engaging, but hopefully as engaging as DDR. And then we're also going to be quantifying the frontal lobe during the individual motor learning experience from first attempt through the final attempt, and then finally through retention. Um, finally, uh, this is a collaboration with another colleague here in the kinesiology department, Katie Potter. She's more of the lead or the PI on this project, um, but I have a very significant interest in the success of this project aside from my colleague being successful. Uh, so the central hypothesis to this project known as the pet ownership effects on brain health, cognition and mobility project is that um, dog owners, specifically older adult dog owners will have better brain health and cognition as well as motor function than non-dog owning older adults. And that this will lead to higher levels of physical activity and social connectedness, which should mediate the relationship between better health, cognition, and motor function. Uh, and this is in a pilot kind of um, proofing phase at this point, where we're looking at two groups of older adults, those 70 and older, with and without um, owning a dog. So here we're going to look at some cognitive domains, thanks to the NIH toolbox, MRI imaging, and overground gate using our sensors. And um, as the dean mentioned earlier on, my wife, dog, and the coast uh, that fit really well into here. Uh, just trying to grab on to perhaps implementing an intervention for older adults, depending on how well this um, proofing and pilot study goes, uh, where we give older adult dogs and see if they improve their physical activity and therefore cognition and possibly uh, quality of mo uh, movement. Um, and that is actually all I have for now. So I'm happy to open this up, but first I'd like to just thank everybody for uh, hanging out on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and with that, I will um, answer any questions. Thank you, Doug, for that wonderful talk. It was really great. Um, and I'm hoping that you can see the group so that you can take questions. I can. Happy to take any of them. You want to you just unmute yourself since there's 19 of us. Um, I don't think we'll be talking over each other. Um, I can start. This is Carrie. Hey, Carrie. <laughs> Laura, Laura just popped in the car, so she asked if I could read her uh, question for her. For sure. So so this is Laura Vandenberg. Okay, so this talk was terrifying for me personally. Doug, as a person who had a pretty severe concussion in my college years, and also both of my grandfathers had PD, if there, if there is time for q and I'd love to hear more about some interventions for folks with PD. Are there non-pharmacological non options to slow any of the disease effects you've been looking at. Um, all right, well, Carrie, thank you for uh, pointing that out. And Laura, thank you for your question. Um, I am not an expert in rehabilitation. I did work with the experts in rehabilitation and very closely paid attention. Um, so I can tell you that there are some exercise techniques that have been fairly effective at at least slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease down, not necessarily reversing it. Um, but there's a program, I don't remember the exact name, but the word big is standing out in my head. And it, it's a program that, yeah, Lisa, maybe you know. <laughs> it's called LSBT Big. It's called the Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. Um, and it's actually developed by, um, the first part of it was developed for voice for Parkinson's disease. And that's why it has the voice part of it in the name. Uh, so that confuses people, but basically the principles that they developed it with having to do with intensity, 
sort of the mode of delivery, keeping the cognitive load really low, all those kinds of things that you were talking about were incorporated in um, uh, more physical and occupational therapy. So they have a series of exercises that, that are done four times a week. So it's intensive. Um, and, and then they have functional activities in the last part of the session. So it might be getting in and out of a car. It might be golfing for people that are higher level. It might be any number of things. And then fine motor tasks as well, kind of all based on this intense delivery of treatment um, and large, large amplitude movements, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So we do a lot of the voice part of it in our department. So that's what nice. I know about. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and then piggybacking off of that, I know there's some work from a group at Northwestern that looks at how um, exercise, specifically cardiovascular exercise, can help limit the progression of the disease of Parkinson's. Um, uh, but the exact parameters for those exercises are escaping me at this point. But it, it is possible, it seems it's possible to at least slow down progression of the disease. Uh, Laura, so I think you're all right. Not that I think you have Parkinson's disease, because I clearly don't. I don't have that ability. I am laughing, Doug. You can't see. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Happy to take them all. Any of them related to my research or not? I'll have one dog, Richard. Um, Hello, Richard. In some of your earlier works where you looked at, you, you showed us data on the relationships between the gait and postural variables and the cognitive variables. And it certainly, I think these are some important findings, but, but adding to the theme, I mean, there's obviously still a lot of variation, right? So the explanation is maybe 30 to 40%. So what, what else do you think is going on? I mean, do and, and, and you're proposing, say, some other type of gait studies. Is it that we need to be looking at different types of locomotor assessments or other cognitive tests? A great question, Richard. I think it's, um, I, I think gait assessment, even the lab, is still pretty limited to um, overground gait or treadmill based gait, which does a good job mimicking the real world, even when we add in the secondary tasks, but does a really poor job of um, getting at what true gait demands we have on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, something that I probably did a poor job trying to highlight is <clears throat> these behavioral outcomes, gait and cognition are, are fairly straightforward to assess and quantify in clinic, out of clinic, in lab, anywhere really. Um, but it, it still leaves gait assessment um, kind of incomplete because we're, we're just assuming that the cortex is working equally across all these individuals. So even if the behavioral gait outcome is similar between somebody with Parkinson's and an older adult, it doesn't mean that they're getting to that same outcome the same way. And I think it's really important to start to look at the, the full system at, uh, together, that being the neurophysiological, ideally we can get the brain stem in there, especially with a, a group of Parkinson's patients, right? Because the basal ganglia is so important for that. Um, unfortunately, mobile imaging techniques just aren't there yet. But I think starting out with what we can do, cortically speaking, um, is, is the right first step to try and really provide a more complete view of gait performance that takes into account how the cortex is getting there and if the cortex is getting there in a different way is that going to be is it a sign a biomarker for increased risk of falls later on or even currently that might otherwise go unnoticed until a fall occurs and at that point it's too late i hope that answered the question yeah thanks thank you richard Well, Doug, let me just say thank you once again for a very
exciting and interesting topic um, to understand what your research is contributing to. And I think as we have learned that the area of concussions, especially among athletes, is going to become increasingly more so important. And so I can sort of see you taking off on um, looking at that population as well. But we're so excited to have you in the department. And I'm really very um, grateful that several members from the, the Com Disc Department came and joined because clearly they're very interested in this health outcome as well. So thank you all very much for attending and I wish you a very pleasant evening.